This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released July 5th, 2021. Episode 548, sponsored by Inspectar, the last line of defense. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm short on time. And <laughs> short Chris Campbell t- from Contextual Electronics. Yeah, nice to yeah, meet yeah. you short on time. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a slightly shorter episode today. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll pad it out with, uh, you know, 10 minutes of me singing uh, the national anthem or something. You know, it's upcoming. Where well, this is going to come out the day after, I think, U.S. Independence Day. So. Oh, I'm is sure. it? Oh, oh, it's oh, yeah. bloody yeah. July, July, isn't 4th. it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot fewer uh, fireworks show this year, unfortunately, because uh, everything. I don't know if you heard about like the weather over here, but it's like oh, I heard it's, it's just it's, uh, it's like positively Australian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Seattle is the new outback. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I heard like one in a thousand years heat wave. Yeah, is that it's like insane? Yeah. Right. I mean, not not where Jeez. I am. It's been like right. it's been like seventy degrees here, seventy Fahrenheit. Right. So like twenty. 22 C. Where's the worst of it? Uh, I saw some stuff in British Columbia, which is actually up in Canada, but like the Pacific Northwest, it was hitting like like 45 C. For those who don't know what the Pacific Northwest throws oh, sorry, some that, cities at, that's it. Uh, Seattle, Seattle, uh, right? Portland, like Whistler, British Columbia, right? Uh, just basically like the upper left corner of the upper left of the U.S. or the lower, but the lower left. That's not what you'd Canada. expect, just due to oh, totally. the elevate, like just due to yeah. the. That's why it's so like... it's so potentially dangerous too, because a lot of right. those places, you know, you go to Portland, it's like known for like being like rainy and cold, uh, wet and wet and miserable. Yeah, exactly. yeah it's yeah. like so Melbourne. There's, there's a lot like less the air conditioning the out there. Yeah. Right, yeah, that's actually <laughs> right. a really that's a really good comparison because uh, it's you know it's got an artsy and it's you know yeah it's, yeah of uh, course yeah and riots yeah. and yep yep yeah Wolves. yeah yeah <laughs> so, oh um, boy yep yeah I like yeah. I love both cities they're great yeah but it's uh, it's crazy and so um, wow. yeah lots of uh, extreme weather events happening in <laughs> in the mm. uh, the world yeah it's it's nuts. So, is, is that mm. going to lead to uh, power outages? Because I heard like Texas or mm-hmm. oh, no, or is it or is it bloody California again? Is warning people of California? Yep, yep. Warning That's, people uh, all, of all um, those places. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. Rolling yeah, blackouts it's... because well, yeah, they don't know how to manage their grid. You know, I I've started thinking about this. So like, you know, I'm moving to a new house, uh, hoping to yep. put solar on top of the house. Yep. But just kind of thinking about like going forward i mean not that i think it's a, a broad solution but like mm. at least from like a a localized solution of just battery backup type of you know like stuff that we've talked about on here before you've talked about getting too and it's just i have kind of that i that, can uh, i can update you on that situation if you like oh that'd be great yeah yeah great. it's yeah. like um, now unfortunately if you've seen my videos of my solar installations i the solar panels are not on an ideal roof they're not like it's not facing north here, south, ah, got it. Yeah, south yeah. for you Yanks, right? right. We, we, which is the ideal, you know, place to put it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's no, it's sort of like westy kind of, you know. So as as got the sun it. sets so you get in a lot the of afternoon, nighttime sun, yeah, yep. yeah, it's sort of the afternoon sun is where we get our peak sort of thing. And in you know, I've expanded my system to a eight kilo. Is it wait eight kilo? Yes, it's an eight kilowatt system now. We got five point one installed i had an existing three kilowatt system so 8.1 so you think you know that's a pretty decent size system and yeah that's like in winter system, time right? no no <laughs> yeah. it's not even close to covering our needs in uh winter uh, it's just piss poor because i moved my existing three kilowatt system onto an even less optimized east side so it gets mm. the morning sun kind of sort of but i'm that's a three kilowatt system the best i've seen out of that so far is like one kilowatt Oh, it's wow. like, okay. yeah, it's pretty poor. Yeah, but it's still better yeah. than like, it's, it's not oh, costing I mean, you anything, right? Yeah, but no, no, no. It just cost yeah. me a couple hundred bucks to move it to the other side in labor, yeah, you know, right, not, right, so right. not, you know, so it's fine, but like, yeah. it's just, you know, it just yeah, bugs yeah, me yeah, that I've got this more, three right, kilowatt system and it's one kilowatt. Yep. Now in yep. summer, of course, I expect this to be entirely different mm. ball game, but, but in right. winter time, no, no, mm. I've got What's, I got what's the five kilowatt panels getting? What are they getting? Oh, well, they cannot, because I'm only using 290 uh, watt inverters, 14 Mm -hmm. times 290 watts peak, 
the best I can get out of it peak is four is four kilowatts. I will never get five kilowatts out of it, even if oh, the sun was directly on top of it. Yeah, uh, that's that's because of the actual inversion. Got that's it. the inversion clipping. Yeah, two hundred and ninety watt inverters on a three hundred and seventy watt panel, and I've done a video explaining why that's the case and how, in theory, you don't lose a lot of energy overall. You notice I said the word energy and not power. Energy right, overall yep. in terms of, because that's what you've got to look at. You've got to look at the energy equation over the whole year. You can't just look at, oh, I've got 370 watt panels and you know I want to get 370 watts out of it. Well, that's only for a brief part of the day. Do you get that? Like you know, mm, half an hour yeah. or an hour or something. Yeah, yeah. So you might, you might lose that, well, well, you will lose that peak tip, but then you gain in the side lobes if you know what i mean you know you're getting in the side mm -hmm. part of the curves where it's under so anyway right. yeah yeah, yeah it, it doesn't meet our needs in winter time so there's uh, like uh, yeah this is and i'm talking it doesn't even meet our needs without the car without charging the car oh wow so it's okay. like when you include charging the car have you like like incremented the whole house too or not incremented but like measured everything like do you, do you know what are the big is it like heating is the big one or what are, what are the actual to have it well broke it down no it's just that we you know we're like work from home now it's kind of you know nicole works from home mm -hmm. and it's kind of mm -hmm. yep yeah. and all of our needs are going during the day which is good sure which is sure. good because yeah. the sun's up and we're using it it's just that in winter we're not doing enough you know because in winter time she programs the air cons to come on in the morning for the kids Right, so that they're comfortable uh, yep. and the house yep. is comfortable. You know, you guys need um, the air conditioning in the, in the winter. Yes, that's intense. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like this. This like might be my like. I don't think it's gonna be quite as bad where I'm moving, but like that. I don't have. Well, that we now. don't need it. Like I don't need it, but she turns them on. Sure. Right. Sure. No. Yeah, yeah. It's just a like comfort level. I, I get it. It's fine. It's a comfort like... thing. Like that's the thing, right? If we had if we had storage and the power was out, right, and then our house was still up. Our house is still up and running because we had storage. Then we'd go into frugal mode, right? Mm -hmm. you, you would go, yeah. okay, we're not programming the air cons to come on. We're not going to use the oven. You know, we're not going to like, you know. Right. You would just cut back, right? Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. You would absolutely cut back if the power failed. But the point I'm trying to make is we don't even have, with an eight kilowatt system, enough to power our basic needs let alone, you know, charging the car, which is, you know, an additional yeah, need, yeah. even though it's only 2.2 kilowatts, you know, it's only. So so in uh, summertime, yeah, our system will give over five kilo, you know, it might, might get up to six kilowatts, something like that, uh, power output, which will meet our, our, our peak demands go up to about eight kilowatts, depending on how many things are on at the same time. Yeah. So, mm. you know, if you've got the car, if you've got a couple of air cons, if you've got the dryer on, or, you know, if, if you've got the washing machine or the dishwasher on and all sorts of things that use, yeah. you know, those yeah. those heaters to heat up stuff, then, uh, yeah. I was actually thinking about this the other day of, uh, like, historically, what is what percentage of, like, power that has been generated of all time, right? If you, like, took all mm. power and then you said, what percentage has been used specifically for powering embedded devices? Right? Is it like 0.001%? Is it less than you know? Just thinking about like how how like percentages like heating swamps out any oh, kind of it, computing. It, it would totally. You'd be down in the sub 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 one percent. Yeah, I mean like when especially you're if you like take in, out like industrial and, and and heating and yeah. everything else. Yeah, oh, exactly. even if you took out Bitcoin, yeah, no, right. you're still yeah. down in the point one percent because the mm -hmm. the energy's so low. In they're, they're embedded devices for goodness sake. That's you know, they, they run on a coin cell, right? Right, right. Well, I, I mean, you, you start to get more numbers maybe, but but yeah. Yeah, just no, about... I don't think that even the numbers can add up. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the heating stuff just swamps out everything. I mean, heating yeah. heating and cooling is just such a, a massive thing. And I guess now locomotion as well with cars, right? And... Well, yeah, exactly. Are you including the 100, 200 microcontrollers in, in, inside the average car? Like, yeah, but you, I figure that's right. a fraction of any car as well, right? I mean, like, what what yep. fraction of the power to run all the controls uh -huh. throughout a, an electric vehicle, even compared to the to the motor, it's got to be yeah, sub no. 0 0.1 percent, right? It's not a lot. Although my car will actually, you know, warn you that hey, you've got the accessories turned on, the radios turned on, and you know you're not oh, driving or doing anything. It'll actually automatically shut you down to save that standby oh. power. Because it doesn't just want to yeah. piss away the 
power, but yeah. but you know they're reasonably powerful computers on there to run all those graphical user interfaces and you know stuff like that. Yeah, it yeah. isn't just running like a little Raspberry Pi or something. You know, it's running mm-hmm. a, a decent processor, so it's fairly power hungry to run all that screen and everything else. Sure, sure. All the Raspberry Pi is is not a small no, amount of power either. Doesn't cut it. <laughs> yeah. Although I, I did get the uh, CM4. I saw, I've seen that the current on that. If you don't have like USB turned on, that's like the nice thing about it. It is mm-hmm. the tricky thing about it too, is like when you plug in a, uh, a compute module four, which is the newer one, mm-hmm. it like doesn't have a lot of stuff turned on in like the device tree overlay, which enables right. all the, a lot of yep. peripherals. And USB is one of the ones that really sucks down a lot of the power that I didn't, I didn't realize. And that one is turned off by default. Okay, interesting. I've never thought about a USB core and how much power it takes, really. I've never yeah. never yeah. had to do the equation on that. It's like, you know, like micro supply, you know, and uh, other mm-hmm. USB projects. It's like, you know, you've got to have USB. So the power is what it is. You just don't care. Yeah, what right. You know, it's not something you can turn off because it's an essential part of the product, you know. Yeah, so, I would figure that's also got like, that's like USB to serial versus like a, you know, a higher level integration of usb drivers and stuff oh yeah if you're pumping out your you know if you're pumping out huge amounts of data and stuff like that then streaming yeah, yeah. then yep. i imagine it's yeah yeah so mm. it was only like uh three you know plugging in just straight off the shelf it was like 300 milliamps or so which is you know not a small amount yep. of current but it's yep. not terrible you know so uh, less than i would have than i guess you know having used other Raspberry Pis in the past and monitored on those five volt buses, and they're like, hmm, how about default of eight hundred million? <laughs> well, I, a standard Raspberry Pi idles at about two watts, just sitting there doing nothing. That's a fair bit. Two watts is, geez, you fly to the moon on that. Sure, sure, it's yeah. a fair bit of power. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> so you know, if an average home had ten Raspberry Pis running embedded stuff you know if you have your smart stupid light bulbs sitting there waiting for your wi-fi to turn the <laughs> stupid thing on then you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all this stuff's gonna add up it, it so, will yeah it's a good reason to uh you know embedded devices and the connectivity piece is what really gets you i mean like that uh i was just asking some people on my forum about this about just like using our tosses and like where people start from when this stuff comes into play and it really uh, the the place i put it at is like if it's going to have networking if it's going to try and talk to the internet, it's just like you, you kind of start moving up the stack of like moving away from like bare metal or even just like, like I would normally do with like a, you know, a NRF 52s SDK and just, you know, using the SDK and, and examples and stuff like that. Mm. No internet of things. That's the solution. Okay. Our, that, that is the other solution. Yeah. It's just to, to not, to not have anything connected, I suppose, but that seems less likely these days. <sighs> no, come on. Resist resist okay all right all join right. the resistance Chris. <laughs> okay all right <laughs> come on all right all right, all right. <sighs> bloody internet of things no wait why does it always end up at bloody embedded internet of things this show this show uh, because that's what i do for a living that, now? that's what i know that's what you do for a living it's on your brain i know i uh-huh, knew the answer yeah. it was rhetorical yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's 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 yeah it's not easy you know mm. that stuff mm. trying to learn oh, more boy. yeah it's all right you have to feed the kid it's okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. She's screaming in the background. I don't yeah, know if you I can could, hear yeah, it. Yeah, I could just hear, hear a little it. bit. I'm probably. not sure if yeah. you can hear it at home, but yeah, well, if I yeah. can hear it on headphones, probably. Yeah, you probably yep. probably hear a little bit. She's she gets grumpy about IoT stuff too. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Yep. So uh, you're still in Chicago, are you? You haven't moved? Yep, still here until August. Uh, right. Starting to line up all the logistics of that stuff. Lining up the uh mm-hmm. you know, I haven't even thought you know, we talked a little bit last time about like lab stuff and getting set up in a lab and or yep. setting up a lab rather. And uh, I, I can't even wrap my brain around that yet. You know, it's just like everything else is mm. still <laughs> so up in the air. So we'll, I'm sure we'll, we could dedicate a whole episode to that sort of thing. Right. But you know, Greenfield lab, what do you do then? Right. I mean, we could, I guess we could talk about it now, but like when you have a, just a blank room, I guess you, you've already done this a couple of times. When you have a blank room and then start. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I've never really, well, I've, like at home, I've never really had that 
because I've sort of, you know, it's always been cobbled together from the lab before. You know, I, I, I right. reuse yep. the existing benches. I re, you know, every time I move lab or even, you know, home and here and all sorts of even, even around home, you know, back mm-hmm. when I was a kid, you know, my old, you know, I used to have a, I posted a photo on Twitter of one of the, oh, yeah, the rare shed, photos right? of my shed yeah, that yeah. was in the backyard, you know, that I had as a kid. And I eventually moved out of, you know, the shed, I don't know why I just moved it into my bedroom and then, you know, moved it into a back room of the house once my sister moved out and it was kind of, you know, just, and, and then I moved it into the pool room and then like, yeah. it's, 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 it's been all <laughs> over the shop. Right. That's right. right. And, uh, yeah, it's just, and, and it's always cobbled together with, you know, stuff I've had existing. Right, especially it's, as a kid you know, too. Right. It's yeah, like you yeah. get whatever you can get your hands on. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very rare at a work situation that, you know, they've gone, you know, I've walked into a company and there's nothing there and they've gone, radio kid, set it up. You know, here's your budget. <laughs> right, like, right, right. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've had that where I've joined a new uh, department and they've said, okay, you're the only electronics person here. We don't have anything. Buy gear, gear you need. And I've had to set up, you know, labs from scratch, but not like blank room kind of stuff. You just sort <laughs> right, of make, right. make, like the make do with the, really the existing. The big thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. layout and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, it it depends on your you know needs. It uh, like depends on what kind of stuff you're working on. Well, the other thing too is I worry I worry about like having the infinite you know the infinite workbench space right. If you if, right. if I could yeah, have yeah. a room that was infinite workbench space, yeah, it's just all going to spread out. You know you know this problem. Oh, right? of course. I mean, just, no, I'd yeah. I'd have a bloody bench for every project, and every project would sit on its own little <laughs> bench. Right, you know, right. have like one of those and, carousels and where the bench just, right. just folds you know, down can, for the next thing. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, if I had, you know, if I was rich, yeah, I would have, I'd build, you know, like a thousand square meter lab, you know, like sure, just sure. because, right? Buy your own house and just that, that one house is just, yeah, uh, right. Just, just the, the, the lab entire house, yeah. house is the lab, yeah. uh, which, which, which <laughs> I'm sure we've talked about in here before. I have thought about. Yeah. Yeah. You have mentioned that. Yeah. Unfortunately, prices have just like gone That's up bananas. Yeah. 70% here in like a year. So, oh, yeah, boy. there goes oh, that boy. idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buying a house mm. nearby and turn converting it to a lab. So, yeah. yeah well. I mean, the things I think about are like having a lot of vertical space is important to me. Like, so, like, I, yeah. I like to have, you know, like the, the equipment up a little bit. And then, but then, like, lighting is the one that always gets me. It's just like, how do I get the most lighting yeah. as possible without it being like in the way, too? Because it's yep. like, you almost need like passive lighting. Cause I think about my, my t- setup I just took down here. Mm-hmm. I had like one, I had like a video light and, but it was like one big light, which was great. It was super bright up until I lean over the board. And <laughs> yeah. It's and then it's all it's just got, like it's all my shit. head shadowing, it, you know? <laughs> yep. So it's yep. like, you need as much, like you need a lot of light, but it needs to be like passive light. So like the whole room's mm. kind of glowing. That's why I just put a, an entire strip right along my ceiling. So it's yeah. like, yep. if I turn on the lights to actually work or shoot video, all the lights go on and it's a giant strip. So no matter where I walk along my, cause my, I've got one big, like, you know, seven, eight meter long bench. Right. And it doesn't matter where yeah, I yeah. walk along that it's all lit up. Cause I've got a, a light strip going all the way, the length of the bench on the ceiling. And it's like, mm-hmm, you know, yeah. so yeah, so I don't really get that shadowing kind of effect. That's nice. Yeah. Which is really annoying. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so lots of lots to plan. I mean, I, I I honestly haven't even been in the room that much that I'm going to be in, so we'll see how that right. goes. I'll have to probably be there first, and then then buy furniture, and then yep, and then yep. you know. But you do have a dedicated room, right? I do. Yeah. How yeah, big is be... the room? How how big That's we talking? A good question. Probably, if I had to guess, probably like four by three meters. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, okay. I mean not small. I mean it's yeah. a good size. Okay, twelve square meters. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah. So it's definitely workable. I mean, it's, yep. it's uh, yeah, it's yep. more than enough room, no, but it's just certainly, yeah, how, how it's, you lay it out then, yep, right? Yep. And just, yep. yeah, standing versus sitting and just all that, all that usual silly stuff like mm. that, you know, just kind of figuring out how to, how to make that work. You just know that you're going to go with the traditional bench with the racks in the back of it for the, the instrument racks and stuff. You're not going to invent something novel. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have time to, honestly. <laughs> right. Okay. You just want to set up and go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got to get, got to get working. Well, th- th- that's another thing. Sometimes you don't have time to think about it because you got to just 
get done. So you just, you know, yeah, borrow exactly. some tables from somewhere. You know, I've I've done that at work places. It's gone, right, I need to set up a, you know, and we need to turn this into a lab. And it's like, well, you just cobble together any tables you can find lying around the company, you know? Exactly. It's yeah. like, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, um, I remember uh, one of my jobs, we just had like, they had like these like old workstations that were like left over and they're like, yeah, we'll just shove those in the lab. And so they were like these big metal desks that had, you know, cabinets and all the stuff you knew, normally want to have, but they were just kind of shoved in there. And so they weren't like particularly useful in that way. Well, that's enough about, I mean, we don't have, uh, until I get into the space anyways, I and mean, we can keep conjecturing, I suppose, but, uh, we should move on to other things, I suppose. Right. Well, you're going to post a photo when it's done, right? Of course, yeah, yeah, and it's going to look exactly like it's going to be a bench with yeah, some probably, racks in the yeah. background. <laughs> it's just going to be, yep. yeah, right, it's it's not going to be right. some super, you know, curved custom space age thing no, where he just no, you know it's a spins square room with his chair and square he's got all these and, different, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, and do you watch the, do you watch him on uh, the YouTube's the Eight Bit Guy? I know who it is, but I don't regularly. Right, don't yeah. Subscribe, anyway, so, he does. Yeah. Um, I I forget his name anyway he did this right he built his own and he documented building his own lab and workshop in the uh background and he just released his uh latest video let me see if i can find it here on the youtubes yeah and he had like he had this curved a uh, table because i think he had it you know like, like he uh stands up in his shot like he when he does his talking head shots he he mm-hmm. does like tear downs of vintage computers and repairs and builds of vintage computers and stuff like that right really good channel so highly recommended if you're into that sort of thing even if you're not still fascinating yeah i mean yeah he, he did the one he was the one who did like the teardowns of like old storage mediums that's the one i think i've seen i think we've linked on here before too yes yes it's like I a think wide so. variety of like floppy disks or something like that or i, I remember something with storage medium most likely yeah anyway here's his uh here's his final construction video Part three, and he's got this like curved bench, and it's like, and he, <laughs> everyone in the comments chipped in and like you know chimed in and said, "Oh, you goofed up all the colors," and everyone went, "Yeah, it's a great layout, but you screwed up the colors." You know, everyone hates the colors of like <laughs> it's, it's it's pure it's, bike shedding right there, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like this uh, bright white marble bench, which looks really funky, but then when you put it on cat and and really dark felt tiled background so it's this bright bench with a you know like really dark blue and gray colored tile so he's trying to go fancy with all these tiles in the background on the wall so you know part of it's acoustic to you know actually treat the room and stuff and everyone's just going no you've got the colors completely backwards (laughs) the bench should be darker and the wall should be lighter so it just yeah completely screws it all up apparently damn i feel i feel a bit sorry for him <laughs> and he went to you know he he actually built a dedicated small house in his backyard yeah, it's like a set yeah it's like a set and then yeah so and it's 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 really great except that yeah everyone complained he goofed up the colors so oh, well. be careful if you well they're the additional requirements you know if you like well us i guess you're you're part of our group i'm I'm part of us. Oh You're my. part of us. One of oh. us. One of us. One of us. Yeah, you should video, right? So, sure, sure. Yeah, although sure. not, not you know, stage studio kind of stuff like right. no, others yeah. do, but you know, still, that's that's something that you have to consider. You've got to consider the color temperature sure, sure. of the lights you use, and you know, stuff like that, and exposure, and angles of light, and reflections, and all that kind of jazz. So, yeah. Sure. So yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. fascinating LinkedIn down below. <laughs> Great. <laughs> See, I would like to do that. A lot of people have asked, you know, why don't you build a thing in your back, you know, your own studio in the backyard? Well, you know, I'd love to, but our land's not that big. So I'm just say your yard's not that big, right? <laughs> I've been there, folks. I, I seen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it. I seen it. <laughs> you seen it. Technically it is. We've got our our land is seven hundred and fifty six square meters, I think it is. So it's not hmm. it, you know, it's like it's average size and our house isn't that big you know it's only a little you know it's a regular four story uh four story four bedroom you know single level you know suburban house kind of thing with the double garage but it's an odd shaped land you know it's got all useless you know triangly bits out the front which you can't use Uh, for jack and you know it's got and we've got five neighbors you know because it's an unusual shaped block and it's like 
you know, mm. it's just really annoying. Yeah. yeah, we just don't have enough. And it does slopes as well, you know. So it's like, eh, we just, yeah. yep, don't have the room. And then you got to have room for the kids to run around, you know. So of course. we've right. barely got right enough room shed, for that. You know? Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> <laughs> barely got enough room for that. So uh, then they'd yep. call the kids flat face. And you can't have that. What? Flat face? <laughs> what? If they ran into the shed, they'd be. The, all, the, all the other kids would call them flat face because they, they, okay. they ran into a shed with their face. Anyways. Okay, sure, Chris. <laughs> you mentioned a jack, and one of the things I've been working on is actually waterproofing. So I'm trying to do like a, not a completely waterproof, not like IP67, but like a dustproof, water-resistant yep. kind of case. That's what I've been working on lately. And I'm curious about your uh, your experience doing, you know, you've done waterproofing in the past. Yep. Thought maybe we could talk through some of that sort of thing, and like you know, so I like have like glands, and I've you know like that. I was, I was right, I was, cable, uh, yeah, 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 cable <laughs> yeah. glands. I, I always yep. misstate it as bladders. I'm always like, you know, it's like a bladder. I'm like, no, it's not a bladder. No, it's it? just it's... a rubber seal that com- compresses around the cable. I'm like, it, it's named yeah. after a body part. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for those who don't know, these yeah. sort of like in quote marks waterproof uh, cable glands or. Yeah. Not waterproof. Anyway, they're like through. That, yeah. They're like through through elements yeah. in a plastic housing. Normally, yeah. You... It's it's like a rubber seal kind of thing, which is usually mm-hmm. usually has some sort of length to it. It's not just an O ring. Like there's a you know right, a exactly. strip of you know like a, a ten mil. And it does clamp down on it, and it clamps down and... when when yeah. you screw. Yeah, when you screw it in, then that rubber clamps down on the outer sheath of your cable, and that forms a weatherproof seal not waterproof. yeah i think that's the right way to say it it's not like yeah and there are ip67 rated like glands you can get and whatever but like yeah you're not you're not dunking this thing into the water you know like if you've got a cable going through your through the wall of your box it's probably not particularly (laughs) there is going to be some water ingress you better you better plan plan to have a little bit of that so yeah right when when you've done it in the past i mean was it just like straight to potting you're just like well if it needs to be waterproof we're just potting the whole damn thing not not necessarily no we've done um ocean bottom stuff that is not potted oh, so well we've done both <laughs> we've, we've done ocean bottom stuff which but then if you've got a you know we've, we've had a giant steel canister right or aluminium canister right giant big machine mm-hmm. you know yep. thing which which can survive the crush pressure so it doesn't deform under the under uh, the water pressure because that's yep, yep. part of it you know if your seal starts to deform under water pressure you know anyway those if you machine if you engineer them properly you can get away without needing to pot anything you just need your double o-rings if you're serious about waterproofing double o-rings and uh grease never rely on one o-ring and mm. never and never I, there's not nothing is waterproof doesn't even matter if it has an o-ring if you don't grease it up it must have mm. grease got it just so that because that like gets the final like cracks that it, it might, gets all the cracks and ones. everything else yes yeah. yes okay. and there's mm. you know an art in actually designing the compression ratios for o-rings that's an art in itself you have mm. to get that okay. right so yep and yeah. uh and and you can't nick them like you can't have any little burrs on any machined parts for example that leave like mm-hmm. little burrs and things that could cut through your o-rings and yeah. you know stuff like that but yeah generally you know you have to decide like if it's going to be waterproof it's going to be submerged then that's a different level to just you know it's out in the rain has got to survive yeah you know? that's that's so, closer to what i'm doing is the out yeah. in the rain kind of thing or really just yeah. like industrial environments are pretty common that's that's really yeah. the thing that i'm thinking about there was yeah. one this is a slightly different topic but it is in the water space this was the talk that i helped run back in 2017 it was Nick Bingham about pressure tolerance. So this is basically like now it's underwater and it's getting crushed by lots of pressure like Dave's yep. talking about. So yep. there's, I'll, I'll link that in too if people are interested mm. in that. That was a great talk. Just like stuff, I think I mentioned on the show before, like stuff I didn't consider like how a capacitor mm. yeah. deforms when it's being under yep. pressure and stuff like that. It's just crazy. So, yep, yeah. I know. Not it's doing nice. anything like that here, but it's just, <laughs> right. okay. you know, just the, the water. Yeah. So it's just yeah. going outside, is it? And you just need it to be... Yeah, exactly. Dust proof, right. okay. dust proof, and water resistant. Yeah, that's water, the main thing. Yeah. Weather yeah. wane resistant because people don't know that those IP standards like they aren't designed for like serious immersion. Like there's IP sixty eight and sixty nine and stuff like that, but that's only for like one meter water water immersion rating. You know, it, oh, really? it's not okay. you know. So your IP ratings just go out the window when you're designing stuff for diving and things like that. Got that's it. Just, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 
Yeah, so, I mean, I'll be doing other things too. Like I'm, I'm not gonna, even though it is, you know, trying to keep water out, trying to keep dust out. I'm still gonna like conformal coat the board and make sure you know do testing around. Oh, okay, it you're going for the testing. conformal coat. That's okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, basically, the conformal coat is like if your conformal coat is designed to stop water ingress. If water gets in, if water gets in, you're screwed. Right. right. So yeah. the conformal coating is more moisture and stuff like that, you know, moisture, because generally if you've got something outside, then it's going from temper, it's going through temperature extremes and you get moisture build up and in inside and condensation yeah, and stuff right. like that. Right. Right. Exactly. So yep. you're, uh, so your conformal coating is more for that kind of thing. It's not designed to, oh, if water gets into my box, then the conformal That's coating right. will stop it. Right. No, it's the last dude, line of defense. <laughs> <laughs> if water gets in, you're screwed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, conformal coating, mm -hmm. standard in the military environment, just because, you know, they have to survive the temperature yeah. extremes and stuff like that. Yeah, but totally. uh, potting's good. And then you've got, you know, oh, what, what type of potting do I choose? Do you choose solid? Do you choose re-enterable potting compound? They're fun. I like those because you can get in there and, and you can still yeah, dig it out. <laughs> uh, just pots. No, no, no. You can, you like, know, you, you can actually have um, uh, trimmer pots on your board and still pot it. And you can use uh, oh, like a tra like a transparent silicon gel, and you can like shove your screwdriver through, and actually trim your pot, pull it back out, and it like reseals itself. It's really cool. Oh, interesting. Stuff. Okay, like self healing almost. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So in versus like the the black potting goop that's versus just like, the black yeah. uh, one, which everyone's used to seeing. You know, your chips are blobbed in black epoxy mm -hmm. potting yep. compound. Yep. yep, and things like that. Yeah, I was uh, working on a the lighter on my grill or barbecue or whatever you mm. say in Australia. Yep. I, I was looking at it the other day. Cause like I had a spark jumping across from one of the, one of the outputs to the other. And then I was like looking at it. I was like, Oh, this is actually potting compound back here. But of course it is. Right. It's like, you know, <laughs> right. it's generating a spark. It's like, yeah, you just yeah, want yeah. the spark to go where it goes, but yeah. <laughs> right. Um, don't expect to see potting. Anyway, generally, generally speaking, if you just want outdoor box weatherproofing, you don't need to pot anything. That's just, you know, that's sort of extreme. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah well it's also for like low cost right i mean that's a way to like get it super low cost oh yeah no it's an extra step right yeah that's right. a huge extra cost in production you've got the time to pot it and then you have to put them aside and you've got to wait for them to cure you've got the time and you know you've got to chew up bench space or shelf space where these things are sitting just waiting to cure and, and then you've got the vapors and everything else and you know like ugh, it's like oh i have the case of the vapors <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. it's, yeah, it's, you don't want a pot if you don't have to. Same, same with conformal coating. That's messy business. You've got to have like a spray booth, you yeah. know, and, and like, yeah. it's just, oh, Actually, just, yeah, the no. stuff that's, uh, I think I mentioned on here before, but it's the, pretty horrible I have stuff. like, I have a hand, hand spray can just for like local, localized stuff. And oh, right. just, yeah, you yeah. know, like when it's at home versus having like a, one of those CNC machines. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. But no, if you're making, but you're talking about production or small scale production, production only, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. No. Yeah. Just just go for your weatherproof box. You know, you can get boxes with O-ring seals around the top, you know, just get yep, one of those. Yep. Yeah, just put your waterproof glands. Do you have to have any con controls and switches on it or is it just a like and power in and and antenna out or something? Because I know it's bloody wireless. I know it I know it's no, bloody actually it's wireless, not. right? It's not it's wireless. Not. I mean it's also it's not just wireless. <laughs> 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 yeah, power right. in and then Ethernet in. And so like the oh, that's right. one of okay. the yep. so like one of the uh I was looking I was on my DigiKey page and the mm -hmm. I've been looking through like the various you know, they've got basically O rings on the outside of the You can get weatherproof Ethernet interfaces. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. Yep. You and can it, get them. And it it makes sense from a you know, like mm. Ethernet is galvanically isolated, so like yeah, you yeah. could seal oh, of off course. that. Yeah. Right. You don't yep. have to worry about even water. Oh no! You said there's power in. It's not power over Ethernet. Why don't you run power, power over the Ethernet? No infrastructure for that. So that'll just oh, be okay. powers right. going through one of the glands right. through like a wiring setup. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, interesting problem. Usually, I I kind of step into situations where they've already figured out the the water stuff and the you know just you know the cases are usually not super greenfield for me. I, I'm usually walking yeah, right. into situations where it's like mm -hmm. retrofits or similar. And so it's like, oh, okay, that's already taken care of. And then I just have to work within that constraint. But then, yep. you know, you've done this before too, where it's like, you okay, so now you can have, you know, it shouldn't be too big. It shouldn't be too expensive. It's, you know, there's just like these soft requirements other than like, don't let water mm -hmm. in, 
Don't right. make it too big. Don't make it too expensive. It's like, okay, yep. okay well, that's a lot of things, actually. <laughs> well, that <laughs> you know, rules so then, out one of those custom 200, uh, not custom, but one of those, uh, you know, $200 waterproof Ethernet connectors, you know, one of those military Oh, yeah, true. Jobbies, yeah, right. You know, in the yeah. uh, drab olive, the drab olive <laughs> mm-hmm, of course, colored, right, yeah. you know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the name we've got a show called Drab Olive, yes, I think, yes, right? Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah, I've, I've used uh, yeah. waterproof USB C recently as well, and that was okay. Not waterproof, yep. I think it was water resistant, but water it was, weatherproof. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was definitely like you know the O ring around the edge and stuff like that. So you know, yep. there's definitely a class of products out there like that, but then it just you got to do more 3D modeling to make sure everything lines up properly, and you know, the mm-hmm. then the actual assembly can be more troublesome i think right i like to have a lot of wiggle room on the connectors you know <laughs> yeah of course uh, sometimes you can't yeah. do that jeez no you know? yeah i mean sometimes tolerances are tight you just gotta work yeah. with what you got try designing a product where the connector has to actually where, where where the connector joins the product together and then the product is towed by the connector Oh wow! The That's, product uh, is actually like you know, is, like you yeah. tow like kilometers element. long, many kilometers long, and the all the strain is on the connector. <laughs> like you mm, know, nah, yeah, no, I don't think I'll do that anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I do of... think in in that situation, it would be uh, there'd be a couple more mechanical engineers on the. There's product a few than, more mechanical engineers <laughs> yeah. than us. Electronics engineers, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, so I use Fusion 360. Right. And I'm, like, capable enough. I can, you know, bring in STLs. I can you, bring You can in bring in an STL, files, yeah. You, you just you know, know enough like, to be dangerous. Yeah, same here. I can yeah, bring in an exactly. STL and I can line it up and overlay it with the with the model on the PCB yeah. and, you know, stuff right. like that. Yeah. 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 Step export's real easy out of KiCad. And then, like, yep. okay, I can make these things kind of align and make sure everything's to scale. And then it's, like... I can pretty much figure that out. But you're not at the point where like, oh, I've got to design my own custom connector. Let me start right. the 3D yeah. CAD model on that, yeah. doing that. You yeah. know, I don't think yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll be doing that ever again. I did that once. Uh, well, right. I, I wasn't doing it. I, I was in a project that was doing it once. So right. it was not me. Okay. And uh, that was a bad, bad idea. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it was a bad idea to do a custom connector on that product or it was just mm-hmm. like not, not easy? It was just not easy. I mean, it right. was like a... You know, mm. I don't know if there was, you know, like in retrospect, you kind of look back at those kind of projects too. And you're like, well, was there actually any other solution there? And it's like, yes, but only if you would have made that decision six right. months prior, because it was yep. like, all right, we had already made the case. We had already made all these assumptions about what we could do. Mm-hmm. And then we were basically trying to kind of squeeze in a custom connector where we were replacing another connector that was off the shelf. And it's like, okay, but then at that point, you're basically you have you're so constrained that it's like you just gotta <laughs> right. work with what you got and that makes it difficult here in the amp hour we look for sponsors who help our audience learn today our sponsor inspector is not only helping people learn during the show but the tool also helps users learn more about their electronic devices on their bench i talked to liam from the inspector team about how they combine augmented reality and electronics to create a useful tool but more importantly i was curious about how our listeners could get started using the tool quickly We have a library of what we call sponsored projects. Those are PCBs that we've been able to go and calibrate ourselves, or have some touch with the creator to make sure they they want this to be uh, published more openly. And then what you can do is just use your smartphone, take any PCB that you may have bought from SparkFun or a couple other open source projects, and you can view the overlays directly on top of the PCB and see how things are connected. If you're new coming into electronics, it actually is pretty interesting to see people make those connections of like, oh, okay, this is how it had to be routed so that we we could get the connections onto the bottom side of the board versus the top side of the board. I also wondered how inspectors being used by professional electronics designers and their manufacturing partners. The first use case of inspector is to save time and avoid mistakes while you're working on a PCB with your hands. So anytime you're kind of manipulating a PCB to do some testing or debugging or validation in the lab, you can use Inspector to save time uh, and avoid mistakes while you're doing that. Our software makes the correspondence between the physical PCB, which uh, you have a camera pointing at using Inspector, and your 2D layout that you designed while you were making the PCB. And so because we're there making that correspondence 30 times a second, you save a lot of time looking up like where a component is because we can just tell you that immediately. As a consultant, many of my clients are remote, so I could see how this could be really valuable for collaborating with customers from afar. 
I was surprised to learn this is one of the main uses of Inspector these days, since I first experienced it as a mobile app for viewing traces. Right when the pandemic hit, the teleengineering aspect of it, people being able to screen share over Zoom, which was kind of going viral at that same time, and effectively interact with the board just like they were standing over someone who was accelerated a lot by the pandemic. And then I would say something else as well would be creating documentation and markups. When we started building this tool, we had no idea how much time engineers were actually spending in tools like Paint and PowerPoint, you know, taking a picture of a PCB that they had captured on their smartphone and then sort of drawing traces back over it retroactively. And so that's something our tool was already doing. So we built a little drawing tool inside of it. So you can just make those kind of markups directly. Doing drawing markups and change drawings was something I used to do in my sustaining engineering role. And I could see how that could save a lot of time. I asked about what other workflow tools they see in the future. Just the ability to associate step-by-step -step instructions with your PCB design information and play that back to someone with augmented reality. And so, you know, the world we've seen built by, by COVID, kind of everything is happening remotely. And because of that, a lot of times things happen asynchronously. So, you know, out of order. Whereas when people were in the lab together, everything was kind of synchronous and happening all at once. But now you can just take in, you know, instructions you might have for, for work you want done on your board. And if you're not there physically, there's gonna be a way where you can just have those step-by-step -step instructions and associate PCB design information uh, with them. So that someone who's not familiar with your design as a designer, like say a technician or a, an intern you may have working for you, can go and kind of have your perspective when they go and do work on the board and, and not just be like guessing based on their instinct or, or best practices to try and do things right. Inspector allows you to learn more about circuit boards, either within your company or in the open source ecosystem. The collaboration tools allow you to be a better engineer, even if you're not located with your coworkers and manufacturing partners. To learn more and try out the tool, check out the amphour.com slash inspectar. That's the amphour.com slash I-N-S-P-E-C-T-A-R. And now back to the show. I'm staring at a product right now that I was going to do a video on. Mm -hmm. It's it's my first digital camera. So spoiler alert, I was going to oh, do okay. a, a video where like I found my own, my, my first digital camera, which is a Kodak DX3600, right? Yeah. From what's the vintage on that? Like 90s? 2001. 2001 okay. Oh, okay. so it you know yeah. it wasn't the first you know it's not the first digital camera but it's only two megapixels right and it's got two times optical zoom and mm -hmm. it's you know yeah, and nice. it's yeah. like it's it, it's got no live view monitor you've got to look through the little oh, optical the viewfinder, viewfinder yeah. you know yeah yeah but it was you know, it was great in its day but you know it was like sure, one sure. of the cheap point and shoot well it wasn't that cheap it was 800 bucks or something back in the day oh, you know crap. it was like for this you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shoot yeah, this crusty yeah, yeah. two mega and i was going to do that like comparing the image quality of this to like a modern camera like uh 20 years later right i thought that'd be interesting to see if i could you know totally do some you should sort also of compare it to like like the thermal cameras because i think they're like starting to approach that that level already too you know <laughs> oh not really no 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 it's optical come on not thermal that's not a comparison that's just dicking around for the sake of dicking around i mean dave that's kind of like your channel sometimes <laughs> yeah okay fair point <laughs> anyway i'm staring at the bloody thing and it's like okay it's got a compact flash card slot you know because sd cards Ooh, yeah. were invented then right classic and yeah. uh, you know compared to a i don't have a compact well maybe i've got one somewhere buried in the bunker somewhere mm -hmm. so i've got to find that but i'm staring at the usb port on this thing as a little like piss ant custom tiny thing on the side and it's like there's no way i've still got that cable it's like you know nobody used bloody standard connectors and then on That's the right, bottom yeah. it's got it, it like it, it was designed to plug into a dock you know so it had like a docking station which then oh, yeah. plugged so into like a standard a, usb on like the a side. 40 pin connector or something yeah like yeah, that, yeah. So, it's got yeah. this little slidey door on the bottom and then then it just you know yeah, plugs into that. the yeah. yeah dock and things like that and it worked it you know and for so many like i you know for most cameras these days probably won't do it but please correct me if i'm wrong i think mm the novelty of custom USB connectors has worn off, has it? Oh, because every camera uh, yeah. had a different freaking, I've got another Samsung here, which uses this weird, it looks like a bloody HDMI connector, but it's actually a USB multi-shoe interface connector because the designers <laughs> go, oh, no, we don't want to use separate connectors. We can use one and we can share USB and we can That's share right, the, yeah. the video <laughs> output and we can share the audio output and we can like, oh, for God's sake. 
Yeah, this you is know, the I, down. This is the downside <laughs> to vertical integration. When when you get to that level, it's like okay, well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's yeah. just yeah, it's just a pain in the ass. It's just designing a new connector for the sake of designing a new connector. You know, they don't put a standard HDMI on there. They don't put a standard USB on there. It's just come on. What year was that Samsung though? Uh, that's the other thing too. I mean, like I feel like a standard oh, became be more eight, standard, right? Nine years old, ten, nine, ten. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, ten, yeah. ten probably. So you know. I was looking at one of my old, my old, like, for, I think my first LTE phone, and it had like a micro HDMI out. It's oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you don't see that much anymore, huh? <laughs> well, no, no, you still see those on uh, cameras and stuff, on your little on cameras, uh, compact not on phones, sports though. cameras. Oh, no, no, not on phones. On, not on phones, yeah, yeah, that's right. what I was talking about. Oh, yeah. okay, right. No, you don't see a phone with a HDMI output. Yeah. What? Right. To, to drive an external monitor? That's right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. that's rare as hen's teeth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jeez, but yeah, oh, custom freaking connectors. Yeah. Pain in the ass. Yeah, so at the moment, I've got no way to actually get the images out of this bastard. Um, well, and that's so- the other thing too. I feel like some of it was like workflow too, right? Like people like had a digital camera and it's like, came back, you uploaded you uploaded you, your computer you and then you- and then you in, into the yeah. dock and it was just, you know, and it appear as a drive and then you-, you And now know, it's like- and, and now basically, uh, you know, most cameras are in phones anyways, right? So you have right. that. And then the other ones right. are all connected, right? They all have connectivity. And they're all Wi-Fi and that's, connected. They're and that's much better, right? And cloud or whatever, you know, bloody- And that's, that's better, right? Is that a question or a- <laughs> I may be laying a trap here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's better. Let's, let's be honest. It's better. I, I like being able to plug in mm. something. Yeah, yeah. I like being able to plug it, especially as a backup, right? Yeah, sure, sure. I know. Yes. Right. I, I was just I was just trying to get you to say that connectivity was important. Right. Yeah, I get it. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah. Don't worry about me. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, Mister Internet of Things. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> Boy. Anyway, pain in the ass. Yeah. Yep. Speaking I'm of pains, glad, that, I, pains I think, in the I ass. I think that's over with. Yep. Who's yeah. a pain in the ass or what's a pain in the ass? Is it a who or a what? It's a, it's a little bit of both. It's oh. a, a patent troll. This is oh, a, oh, a patent troll. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Nathan Seidel from uh, SparkFun. He, uh, he gives, gives a great rundown on uh, getting, getting uh, a wide variety of different, basically extortion attempts from patent trolls. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they are... Uh, they're annoying and not relevant to the actual work that he's doing. So he actually shows some of the patent that uh, that they claim as being infringed upon with a product they no longer sell, which even the stuff that they were being sold, that they were saying was being infringed upon. It was just they like- They no longer they like, sell it. Yeah. They had done like a free text search basically on the word media. And then they like searched oh, for like something with like up, SRAM. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, bastards. Uh, yeah. It's oh my particularly, God. particularly insidious. You know, as as all patent trolls are, maybe not all patent trolls. Some are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some are a little closer to the truth than others. But uh, yeah, damn, you know. <laughs> Semantic patents. What? Northern yeah. Tool and Equipment Company. What? This is you said, you're reading you're reading from the article there. Is that yeah. Right? No. Well, I'm I'm reading from their letter. I'm reading from their mm. corporate letter, like the like the letter they got from the patent troll. Like yeah. what the hell? Yeah. On computer on computer implemented lexical searching for products based upon semantic attributes. What the hell? What the hell yeah. product were they making that they claim? What is the actual product that they made? The SparkFun one or the yeah, other one? yeah yeah the yeah. SparkFun Spark one was product. that was being claimed was the PC Duino, which they don't even make. They they sold. Oh okay yeah yeah that's old now. Is that even still a thing? Someone in our comments said uh, 221 units over the entire time we carry the PC Duino. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's. Oh my god. And it's the thing, like when you get of a certain size, though, like. Then... And it's not even theirs, is it? It's not even there. They're, they're just a distributor. Theirs, yeah. That's right. Yep. Oh, yep. for God's sake! Like, yeah. come on. There's a great episode of Silicon Valley about patent trolls as well. It was like the one right. guy who was he was suing based on like a song he had written or bought rather. He bought rights <laughs> right. to, and then he basically anything that came close to it, he was suing right. for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, st- I still I still have to watch that series. I've only watched like the first couple. That's a, of probably a good one to. St- it's much further yeah. in the series, but it definitely is like it's in the. Is weeds. it, is it like, still that's... going? How many seasons did they get through? I think they got six or seven seasons. Okay, right. I like the end. A lot of people didn't like the ending of, of the series, but okay. I thought it was funny as hell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, it's definitely worth watching. It's uh, okay. Yeah. Jeez, that's that's ridiculous. When you go after a 
open source manufacturer. I distributor. Is is, is the PC oh yes, the PC Duino is open source, isn't it? I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it yeah. is. Um yeah, I like that's just that that's insane. Yeah. Yep. And which uh processor did did that use like an Intel thing? Did it I don't remember the PC Duino used specifically. Used like an Atom yeah. processor or something, yeah. didn't it? Or something like that. Mm. Yeah, it looks in Intelly mm. kind yeah. of. I don't know. But <laughs> yep. Oh boy, that's no. Yeah. But so what's the conclusion? Did they did they tell them to F off? What did they yes, do? Yes, that is the that is it, the latest. Is it settled? That, there's no settle. Oh, it, basically okay. come and get it kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right there, right. So this article is just going well. We're calling your bluff, That's right. yeah. And this is this is the right. uh, okay. court of public opinion, I suppose. <laughs> not, not, okay, not yep. that a patent yep. troll would have any shame, but uh... <laughs> no, 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 they wouldn't. Yeah. But I've 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 actually made a company back down, threatening them with exposure like oh, that. Okay. I yeah. I had a uh, trademark uh, troll. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah, I, I had a trademark uh, Moto Group, Motor, Motor, M O T A. Who's a drone? Mota, M O T A. I I actually just tweeted out the video just the other day because I found in my archives. I actually did a video of it ready to release, mm. right? And I actually sent them the link, you know. And like, so their legal counsel, it was that drone, that drone that uh, failed, you know, that epically failed and went bust. Anyway, it was the company who bought the IP rights to this failed drone company, mm, yep, right? Yep. And I had done this news article, you know, this news video about the news that they'd failed and it was all big, huge tech news at the time uh, that this company went under. Anyway, they bought the rights to it and then they tried to get one of my my videos taken down on a trademark claim because I mentioned the word and because I mentioned their trade, which they now own the trademark to the name of the product. Wow. I couldn't even say the name of the product in a video. Yeah, that's bonkers. And well, a- according to them, right? Yeah. So I uh, sent a uh, sent an email to their uh, CEO and their head of their legal counsel and said, "Hey guys, yeah, there's uh, you guys are going to get absolutely destroyed <laughs> on this. It's going to destroy. Trust yeah. me, don't don't piss me off because I'm going to destroy your reputation mm. publicly." And they backed down mm. and they just went, "Yeah, we have no- and 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 they had no case, mm, right? Definitely. They had absolutely no legal precedence. I showed them the legal precedences." And every, you know, I, I actually found the court cases that set the legal precedences for why you can't sue somebody for this, for this trademark infringement, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's called normative fair use. Mm, yep. Normative fair use is the, is the legal definition. I threatened them with, yeah, public humiliation and they, yeah, back, back down within hours. And That's great released my my uh, the claim on my video and several other people's who's all, who also they targeted as well well we get to we get to let dave win on a on a end on a high note here because i i gotta go man yep. this is a two you gotta go all right two minutes left any any last cool. last minute uh, happy news anything like that no no not really it's kind it's kind of depressing here at the moment yeah. electronics everybody in the u.s happy happy independence day in the u.s uh go build some <laughs> stuff over the weekend uh, or I guess this is post cool. weekend. Hope you built stuff over the weekend that didn't blow up. So, <laughs> yep. All right. And if you've set up a lab, leave it down below. That's great. Yeah. Chris wants to know, and then I do. I need tips. Ignore everyone's advice, and then just put in an existing. Yep. Just put in a normal bench and a rack. Yep. All right. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Catch you next time.
Yeah, I know it wasn't the national anthem. Come on, please. <laughs>